Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Avi, and I hope we're in a very to stream. Before we launch into the discussion of Adam II's shutdown, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the strand. The strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Road. Searching from Unisquare to Asset Place, Book Road gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 94 years, the strand is the sole survivor now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Whiten. We want to thank all of you for your support. With our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we're thrilled to have with us Adam Tooze for the launch of his new book, Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy. Adam Tooze is a professor of history at Columbia University and the author of Crash, one of the Lionel Gerber Prize, a New York Times notable book of 2018, and one of the Economist Book of the Year and a New York Times Critics Top Book. He lives in New York City. Joining Adam in conversation tonight is David Wallace Wells. David Wallace Wells is a columnist and deputy editor at New York Magazine. He has been a national fellow at the New American Foundation and was previously the deputy editor of the Parish Review. He also lives in New York City. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Adam Tews and David Wallace Wells to the stage. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I should just start, want to start by saying what a pleasure and privilege it is to be talking to Adam about this book, Shutdown, which is, you know, when you're living in history, having real time history is incredibly valuable. And I, I really do feel this book will be the basis of our reckoning with the crisis that we are still living through with the pandemic and everything that it's changed about our world, um, which is, you know, no surprise to say, given the man who wrote it, Adam Tooze, who is um, you know, professor of history at Columbia, um, really prolific and brilliant economic historian who has, in the last couple of years, especially since the publication of his book on the financial crisis, become one of the few people, I, I don't think it's a, a form of inflation to call as a, a true public intellectual, um, able to you know really make sense of the world in real time in ways that are uniquely valuable to all the rest of us who are struggling to do the same. So Adam, thank you for um, inviting me to talk to you about this book. And um, I'm, everyone who's listening, uh, do buy it, do read it. Um, we're going to be talking about its, um, its arguments and its observations um, for a very long time. Um, and I should say before we really get started, also, um, as was just mentioned, we'll be doing a QA and a at the end of the, of the event um, from the audience. And if, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to throw them into the um, the chat or the ask questions function in the, in the Zoom. And um, we'll be trying to devote something like 15 or 20 minutes um, of our conversation to that. So please pepper, pepper us with them. Um, Adam, I thought it might be good for, for us to start with the really the, the broad sort of basic conceptual elevator pitch framing of the book, which is something that maybe should be obvious to all of us about the last year and a half, but I think has often gotten lost in a lot of our understanding of what's unfolding. And that is just putting aside even the disease itself, the scale of the response, the things that we did to protect ourselves, and then the things that we did to make sure that our livelihoods were protected throughout that period is the scale of that is just unprecedented and was probably a few years ago, maybe even a few weeks before it happened, um, genuinely unimaginable. So I wondered if you could start by talking us through just how big, unusual, unprecedented um, the human response to this crisis was. And um, yeah, let's start, let's start there. Well, well, let me start first of all by, by thanking you, David, um, for agreeing to, to, to do this session with me um, on, on the evening of, of the launch. I, I really couldn't think of anyone. I, I would rather have this conversation with following your magnificent book on on the climate crisis and its implications. And may I also thank the Strand Bookstore, which is, as our, as our host said, um, quite rightly said, an absolute New York institution. So it's it's a real privilege to to be here as, as somebody who's moved to New York relatively recently. I'm still pinching myself a little bit. Um, yes, 2020, um, indeed, uh, by virtually any metric you apply. Um, apart perhaps from mortality. So if you, if you simply look at COVID as a medical uh, event, you'd have to say that it ranks in the sort of upper middle tier of pandemics which has struck humanity. Um, 
it's clearly nowhere near as lethal in its impact as the Spanish flu in the aftermath of World War One, let alone the great cholera epidemics of the 19th century or the plagues of the medieval and early modern period. Um, what is truly spectacular is the way in which we have collectively chosen, and I, I, I would emphasize that, chosen to react. Now, who chose and under what circumstances and whose choices dominated other people's choices is a, is a huge and complex terrain, and I map some of us in this book, and, and that is, as it were, the zone of the politics of the epidemic. But the, the upshot of it is that we did something completely unprecedented in, in history. And we shouldn't relativize that, as I think liberals in the West were tempted to do when China began its response to say, oh, well, you know, epidemics go back to early modern Venice, they would shut the city down. This is all true. But 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 no one, no country had ever attempted to isolate a city of 10 million people in the way that the Communist Party in China attempted, uh, set out to do in late January, let alone an entire province like that of Hubei. And then spreading out across that vast country, most major conurbations were effectively shut down by the middle of February. And then, of course, it extends to the whole world. So the, the figures are absolutely staggering. You know, 3.3 um, billion people uh, in their workplaces in one way or another restricted from their normal, from going about their normal business. Um, one, somewhere between 1.6 and 1.8 young pe billion young people furloughed from education, a completely unprecedented halt in the accumulation of what economists like to call human capital. And as a result of that, um, at our best estimate, a 20% collapse in global GDP, not over a period of years, as in the Great Depression of the 1930s, but in a matter of weeks from a standing start of a relatively normal economic situation in early January to to an absolute you know, implosion. And we all remember um, the nightmarish you know, run of unemployment numbers in the United States, which again, are simply without precedent. E economists in future will, will struggle, I think, to actually incorporate this event into any effort at systematic quantification, because we've had an extreme outlier event. In climate discourse, we talk about this all the time, right? The need to take account of tail risks. Well, one showed up in this dimension of, of our lives. And then in the book, of course, what I try and do is not stop there, but then to ask the question, OK, how does this ramify? And in complex ways, this shock is, of course, associated with a series of dramatic political and geopolitical crises, which again mark the year as not really like anything we've seen before. I mean, obviously, the, the domestic political story in the United States, a much more positive story in Europe where we saw again, a, a series of steps which most people, I think, would have thought impossible with regard to the forward development of the EU. And then, you know, on the large scale um, uh, of geopolitics, uh, a really dramatic uh, acceleration of tensions between the West and China. So the, the, the book attempts to map that, that intersection of this of this biological risk, the economic shock, and then the ramifications of that out across the political and geopolitical system. And one of the things you didn't mention in detail there is just the scale of support that was offered, not just in wealthy countries like the US, but all across, really all across the world, especially the US and the Eurozone. Um, yeah, I mean, the staggering thing is that all of that would have been infinitely worse if it hadn't been for the huge countervailing resources mobilized. Um, absolutely. I mean, the American economy was essentially in freefall in, in April and May. Um, and um, so, yes, now it's, now it's judged to be bigger than it would have been without the pandemic, right? It's, exactly. You know. yeah. So, so we've, 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 we, the shock was so large, it mobilized countervailing forces so big that it actually has then accelerated us above trend. The labor market is still struggling to fully recover. But um, no, it's, it's, it's staggering. And, and what is hidden in this and the reason why the countermeasures are as large as they are is on the one hand as it were the 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 the, the story that affected tens of millions of people indeed hundreds of millions of people around the world of, of, of enforced unemployment and huge loss of income and then buried within the plumbing of the global financial system there was an almighty you know kind of blood clot you know, near heart failure, fatal stroke kind of moment um, in the most important single financial market in the world, which is the US Treasury market. And when we talk about the central bank response, it's very important. And this is where the sort of the technical bit of the book operates is to try and tease out the relationship between the different economic measures, which 
on the face of it, in, you know, it was difficult not to think in terms of the precedent of World War Two, the coordination of fiscal and monetary policy. But, but the the kind of the I call it the Frankenstein quality of 2020 is in fact that these two bits don't actually connect. It's like the brain is not is sort of stitched together in the middle because what they were really doing, the central banks is is preventing that blood clot in the treasury market from just taking the whole system down. And and as a result, they were buying assets at a rate which hugely exceeds the rate at which they purchased assets in 2008. I mean, it's utterly staggering. $70 billion plus a day, a day in asset purchases being operated out of the New York Fed office, not very far away from the Strand bookstore. Um, that's more than a million dollars in asset purchases every single second for several weeks. And, and that is, uh, you know, vastly large, an order of magnitude greater than the interventions that we saw in 2008, which themselves were totally historically unprecedented. So it really is like vast forces being mobilized to try and prevent this from becoming a runaway disaster. So why, how did that happen? I mean, if, if all of this was unprecedented, aside from the disease itself, how did we get into a position where really across, um, you know, the wealthy world in particular, there was a willingness to do so much more and move so much more quickly um, than there had been, well, in one sense, 12 years before with um, the crash of 2008, but in another sense, as recently as January of last year, when many commentators in the West looked at what was happening in China and said, what was being done there to stop this was impossible to achieve in countries like ours. And to be sure, we didn't go quite as far as they did, but we we got pretty close and then we extended those policies for a very long time. How did we how did we move that far so fast and get so so much, you know, so so far beyond what conventional political thinking would have said was the limit of um, political response to a crisis like this? What what explains the unprecedentedness of of um, of our response? Well, the crisis itself, I mean, the, you know, the United States has not experienced the labor market shock like the one that we experienced in, in, uh, in, in the spring of 2020. Uh, and, and broadly speaking, amongst a large section of the economics policy making community and within the political class itself, I think there was simply panic. I mean, the, the mood was one of, I, I personally don't remember ever feeling as shocked uh, by any, uh, and I spend my life, you know, uh, digesting economic data, and I have never seen anything that just shook me in the way in which the unemployment numbers that were coming out every Thursday morning at 8.30 a.m. It actually tended to happen in the middle of a therapy session that I have, and it was on the phone because we were like, you know, locked down, and the, the, the thing would just go crazy in my hand as I was trying to talk to my shrink. And it, so it was this sort of, like, real panic inducing uh, um, uh, economic shock that that, that opened the, the floodgates of political action. It took different forms, it's worth saying, where it depended on the institutional context. There were some systems like the European ones, which were much better set up to deal with a shock like this. If you've got an unemployment insurance system that really works, if you've got a short time working system, then you don't need to do the massive improvised welfare spending the United States did to just keep people afloat. I think there was also, as it were, basically the lessons of 2008 on the part certainly of centrists, there was really a sense that we had seen this film before and we knew not the mistakes not to repeat. And this is particularly prominent, I think, in the center and left wing of the Democratic Party in early 2021, not so much in 2020, but in 2021, that's really a very powerful impulse not to repeat the mistakes of 2009. And then I think, of course, it helps in the United States case, and in fact, it's true across much of the world, that the incumbents were conservative. So in a sense, like it helps because the people who might ordinarily snipe and might ordinarily adopt a fiscal conservative position as a way of scoring points against the liberals or leftists were themselves in office and needed to act. So this is true in Britain, it's true in Germany. You think of Macron really as a sort of centre conservative now. It's true, of course, in the United States. I mean, heaven knows what the response would have looked like if it had been, you know, a year later and Joe Biden had been uh, president. I don't think there's any reason to expect that the Republicans would have cooperated in the way, in the way that they did. 
Um, so there's also that kind of, you know, luck of the draw in a sense. And then fundamentally, if you stand a long way back from this, there's also just the absence of moral hazard, right? The, the, the fundamental kind of, to call it morals a little highfalutin, but the kind of ethical moral basis for the resistance against the conservative is this case against big government action is people ought to be responsible for themselves. But it's pretty difficult to construct that argument. I mean, tenuous as it is in under any circumstances, but like faced with a pandemic, it's pretty difficult in which you are, as it were, mandating that people not work. It's all not work in conventional ways. It's pretty difficult to sustain that case. It didn't, however, prevent the, the GOP from abandoning Trump over this issue in the summer, right? So there was no there was no consensus by two or three months later, which is where I think we can tell, you know, the effect of the shock narrative. In March, April, there really was, and it's not just in the United States, but worldwide, this sense of a historic emergency that required action. And countries began to be benchmarked against not, you know, how fiscally prudent they were but how much they were doing. I mean, so we really have this extraordinary topsy-turvy situation where the IMF is criticizing an at least notionally left-wing government in Mexico for failing to do enough fiscally. In other words, not spending enough and running a large enough deficit. So there has been learning, there has, you know, there were political circumstances, but there was something also very particular about this crisis which changed the, changed the discourse. And how permanent do you take those changes to be? I mean, we were talking just before um, before we sort of joined the audience about whether your perspective on some of these questions have changed since you wrote the book. I think you finished it in April. And, you know, a lot of what you're describing as the dizzying scale of the response, I shared a lot of that dizziness last year in particular, um, feeling, especially coming at, you know, coming at the subject of the, um, pandemic from the subject of climate, I felt that we were doing so much more than I thought anybody on the climate left believed was possible and had been moved there so quickly that I was frankly inspired about what that meant going forward. There has been some continuing um, sign of that same sort of increased willingness to dramatically spend um, Especially to protect the well-being of, of of citizens and the role of the the aggressive role of the central banks that you highlighted is obviously very different than it was in the immediate aftermath of um, of two thousand eight. Nevertheless, you know, things seem in the U.S. but not just in the U.S. a little bit stalled on some of these metrics. That um, what seemed like a, a brave new era of um, you know, if not quite modern monetary theory, then then certainly. Um, more generous um, public spending. I, personally, I, I'm, a, I'm less optimistic about that than I was six months ago and than I was 12 months ago. And I wondered how you see, you know, how you see all of this playing out going forward and whether you, whether you think we have seen a permanent phase shift in the way that governments relate to their responsibility um, in terms of supporting the, the well-being of their citizens or whether we have simply pass through a sort of unprecedented crisis, um, done it remarkably well, all things considered, um, but one, you know, after which we will sort of return to maybe not quite the, the, you know, the austerity politics of previous generations, but also not the wildly expanded, um, you know, mission that, that um, governments and central banks seem to embrace as recently as, you know, a year ago. I, I think to answer your question, I, I totally share your sentiment. Um, I, the first draft of this manuscript I had to submit in February to get the production process going, but uh, I, and, and it would have been a very different book if I if if, if that is the, the manuscript that we had gone with. Um, but 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 by April and May, I think we saw the dimensions of of the of the of Biden's ambition and also the obstacles that it would face. And by the dimensions of Biden's admission, ambition, I mean the relatively modest dimensions actually of, of the ambition. And and so the book actually ends on a rather jaundiced note um, on on those grounds. But I think what we've got to put back in here is politics. I mean, you, you've got to put politics in with a capital P in its fully partisan form, not just in the United States, though it's particularly extreme in the United States. And you also have to put back in the time factor, which is that 
we, it, it's far too early even now to judge one way or another where how this is going to end. If you think about the 2008 crisis, the um, austerity push does not begin in earnest until 2010, 2011. So that's two years on from the crisis. So we are not yet at the point where we will really see how this works its way out. And there are two obvious political milestones to watch. Um, one in the United States of the midterms and the way in which the politics of that moment play out and the manoeuvring ahead of those. And um, the other is in Europe, the German elections to be held at the end of September, which will decide to a very considerable extent the attitude of Berlin towards precisely your question. Is this a precedent, what we did in 2020 for further things we'll do, or a regrettable exception we had to make for an extreme crisis, but with no agenda setting uh, consequences? I think, you know, okay. we may... We may be tempted to generalize about these things. We kind of put our social science hats on. But in a sense, the alarming contingency of our moment is that thoroughly structural, thoroughly earth changing, history changing actions are now compressed onto timelines. I don't need to tell you as one of the most brilliant analysts of the anthropocenic condition, which are in fact really short. In other words, what happens in the Biden presidency, that one term presidency is materially relevant to our prospects of survival from 2030 onwards and contingent on democratic politics, contingent on folks winning elections, the right folks winning elections. And there is, I think, a process of learning going on in various, various elite structures. There's a process of learning going on amongst interest groups. There's a process of learning going on at the expert level. But none of that will matter terribly much unless the configurations of political power are also shifting. And there are obstructive forces. And I think we, one just has to recognize the world historic significance of a certain sort of reality denying um, uh, conservatism at this moment. And, and the puzzling thing, of course, for anyone of a left wing disposition is it no longer in a straightforward way maps on to what must be the need, not even the long term, but the medium term interests of capital and big business. This is one of the, the truly puzzling phenomena that we saw already in 2008, nine, which is the dissociation of mainstream conservative politics not mainstream, but of, but of a powerful, I misspoke there, but a powerful faction of conservative politics from the interests of accumulation. And, and I think that is, you know, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Um, we've, we've been in, in the Eurozone for some time where, you know, the mismanagement of the Eurozone crisis is profoundly indicative of this fact, right? That it's not good for business, actually, the way the crisis was handled. And one has to say the same thing about the about uh, the United States in this current moment. So it's I, I'm not utterly pessimistic because it seems to me that everything is still to be played for and has to be argued out politically within the Democratic Party and in the you know in certain leadership positions. There's been a huge sea change shift. Just look at the you know the absolute centrality of a figure like Larry Summers in 2008-9 and his real irrelevance to the political configuration in its current moment now. That's just a bellwether, if you like, of, of this shift. Um, but are the, you know, are, do huge political obstacles remain? They certainly do. And this seems like a kind of airy fairy conclusion to arrive at. You write a great big hunking economic history and end up saying, well, it comes down to politics and elections. But, but I think we have to reckon with that fact in its dizzying. I mean, it's vertiginous, right? These elections are now about the whole shebang like that's what we've discovered well uh, before we get back to the us very quickly what do you think is going to happen in the german elections and what do you think it will tell us it's so precarious right now because it's uh, and as you as you will as you may know you know the, the german elections are a two-stage process i mean first it's a it's a a six party six major party system with full pr and they're all going to make get across the hurdle so it's as though the actual cultural political makeup of modern america was represented in parties for each group so the democratic party is split in two or three the conservatives are split in two then you have centrists you have an ecological party that happens and it's been just dizzyingly dynamic um, in terms of who's ahead. And then the coalition negotiations start out the back of that. 
and there are some pretty grim possibilities. Uh, the critical issue to my mind, and it's, you know, I'm a finance guy, so that's where I'm thinking, but the critical issue is who gets the German finance ministry, because it made a huge difference. And again, comes back to this vertiginous sort of dependence on, you know, on, on actual party politics. It, it made a huge difference that the SPD, the, the centrist social democrats, were in charge of the German finance ministry last year because they were able to broker a deal which enabled Europe to escape what in, what in March and April looked like a flat out full on rerun of the Eurozone crisis. And that's not where we ended up. And currently Olaf Scholz, the social democratic finance minister is leading. Um, but the question is what, when they come to the coalition negotiations, what do they have to bargain away to bring the liberals on side? Is there the possibility even of a left-wing coalition? Uh, red, red, green. Um, numerically, it's looking increasingly possible. Is it possible politically um, is, a, is the huge issue and, and what potential uses could be made of that possibility. So it's um, it's just simply too early to call that. And, and uh, you know, the current configuration of the polls, if you had if you had asked, you know, knowledgeable people to put money on that, you would have gotten ridiculous odds against uh, the, the polls looking the way they do now, um, as recently as two months ago. So it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, anyone who said that democratic politics was sort of, you know, we, we underestimate the, the dynamism of electoral politics um, in the current moment. Um, the agendas being debated are, are relatively flat, one might say, but um, that's part of this game, right? No one wants to be too exposed by taking a strong position. It, it doesn't nevertheless matter enormously what, what coalition emerges from that. And then thinking a little more broadly and maybe um, with a focus on the US, I mean, you know, what, what worries me, what stresses me out about the experience of the last year is that um, we almost had an opportunity, especially when, when thinking about the sort of climate challenge that lies down the road from the pandemic, um, we almost had an opportunity to escape some of the electoral pressures that you're talking about because there was essentially a blank check um, that was being written by many governments around the world. And those checks could have been written out to the cause of decarbonization in a much, much, much more aggressive way. In fact, I would say that you know, any sober objective analysis would have found that that was the best investment by far that could have been made. And yet, in almost no country in the world was there a really dramatic investment in, um, you know, in, in, the, in the solving the climate problem. Um, you know, different countries handled it differently, scales of investment were, were, were different place to place. But we're talking about, you know, single digit percentages of, um, of the stimulus projects when you know you really could have gotten away with like spending half of that money um, in some way directed towards climate why why wasn't that opportunity taken then and what prospects do you give us for having it again had you know on the other side of these election of, the, of these next election cycles this really goes to the heart I think of how we understand what happened in 2020. Um, because if you look at it, as it were, in the abstract, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the configuration of political forces, if you look at the scale of fiscal and monetary policy and how they were coordinated, you cannot avoid, you know, in a kind of rational, progressive mind going, God, what an opportunity. God, what an opportunity wasted. Right. You, you, how can you. But then look at the politics of that actual moment. And it becomes, I think, screamingly obvious why that's essentially a kind of utopian thinking. And it's because the central thrust of that gigantic spending in 2020 was totally conservative. It was, it was the, I mean, it was literally the sort of declaration that for everything to stay the same, everything must change, right? Um, but the, the explicit intention was to simply put all the China back, right? To, to restore the so speak, yeah. situation, hold people in place, right? And, and that was what was so liberating on the one hand, because no one was responsible, no one was to blame. So people needed helping. 
But on the other hand, it also meant that absolutely every inhibition that previously was put in place, I mean, this isn't because, as it were, liberal states are on the whole particularly averse to handing out money to the more affluent and more powerful members of society. Obviously, that's kind of key to what they do. But they also, for rather obvious reasons, have a set of rules that restrict the feeding frenzy, right? Because otherwise the state would just be consumed by power plays by different groups. And America comes pretty close to that state normally. Europe actually has a set of very, very tight fiscal rules about you know, not allowing state level subsidies of national businesses to prevent them all competing with each other in the way that American states do for external investment. All of those rules were lifted. Every inhibition went. Money was just doled out. Hundreds of billions of dollars were doled out to big businesses, medium-sized businesses, small firms, and unemployed people. But everyone got money in that huge surge in 2020. And this is the thing we. This is the thing I'm really struggling with in the book is to say, right? I totally, you know, it's very obvious why everyone was sort of having ideas about the New Deal and World War II and new social contracts and green prospects because. At one, at one level, that's exactly what it looks like. And it clearly would, under different political circumstances, have had that possibility, but it would never have happened under other political circumstances. The, the very condition of possibility of this scale of action is, to put it really you know, at its harshest, is precisely that no one with any power or privilege had anything to fear, right? Nothing to fear, right? That, and that's also the secret to, the central bank's actions, right? The reason why they were restrained and conservative and independent, quote unquote, from the 1980s onwards is that they were genuinely concerned about the force of popular democratic pressures and particularly the countervailing force of organized labor to actually constrain their choices. And if that's the case, then you have to build up this whole edifice of making the central bank independent, constraining its freedom to maneuver, having non-discretionary rules, the whole thing. Right? The fact that they can act in the utterly disinhibited way that they acted in 2020 is just an indication of the fact that none of that worries them. Right? The, and, and, and you can then just mobilize the entire balance sheet of government and in a fiat money regime, that's basically the balance sheet to stabilize the existing system. So we went from, as it were, in 2008, relatively restricted interventions to you know, prevent too big to fail institutions from failing to a kind of comprehensive guarantee of everything in 2020. Now, this isn't to say and to slide into the kind of Brennerite kind of reading, which says, and this was just uninhibited plunder, and that means the rich just help themselves, and that's all there was to it. That doesn't capture the complexity of the moment, because there was, in fact, actually spent not redistribution, but very considerable direction of money to the poorest Americans, for instance. The poverty rate fell last year at a more rapid rate than ever before, in well, certainly in recent history, because checks were written to poor people. But that is the key, I think. When you, you know, when you, when we ask that question, why couldn't we have done more with this huge opportunity? We're asking the leopard to drop its spots, right? This thing was the way it was precisely because it was as intensely conservative as it was. And at the moment, when you actually start talking about the kind of infrastructure plan, politics immediately rushes back, and and you know, the freedom for action for the Biden administration turns out to be almost as limited as that for the Obama administration. Europe, again, is slightly different, but that has to do with the way in which interest groups there have configured themselves around a green modernization strategy that really has a degree of momentum and legs there. Well, to, to ask more pointedly about that strategy, you know, hanging over the book to some degree is like the is, is the, the Green New Deal, as it's called in the US, it's called the Green Deal. You know, there are a bunch of different ways of talking about it. You, you just refer to it as the green modernization strategy. Um, is it now possible to present that kind of investment program in a way that does not seem to threaten any of the actors that you're saying can't really be threatened uh, in a spending, you know, it, for a spending binge of that scale to unfold? In other words, has thinking about the economic vitality of green investment changed sufficiently that even in a, in a world less beset by urgent immediate crisis than the one that we've somewhat exited at least in a place like the us since last year can we still say this is like a win-win um yeah. no downside no cost kind of program 
even if we're hoping to spend at the scale of trillions of dollars? Or do you think politically we're still in a place where there will be enough people who feel like losers um, in that system to object and you know sort of um, get in the way? Let's do this again in two years' time when I finish the book about political economy of climate that I was supposed to have spent the last year writing, because that I think is the central question, right, of, of of progressive certainly environmental politics in the current moment is is what is the balance of forces there, and um, in in places like Europe I think the balance of forces is decisively shifted towards a green modernisation coalition. This isn't to say that there are you know renegade. Uh, uh, fractions of, of European capital that resist this transition and the speed of the transition, but there is a distinct sense of, 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 of tipping. And, and the positioning, self-positioning of, say, Shell and BP, the most significant, and Total, uh, the most significant European oil majors relative to the self-positioning in Exxon is quite significant in this respect, right? So um, this shift is possible, um, and there are clearly factions of American big business and capital which could see its possibilities uh, would embrace, I think, a, a concerted regulatory investment led push by um, uh, an administration of any political color that was pointing in that direction. Um, but I think that, you know, the mind blowing thing about the United States is that the GOP, apparently no significant part of it is available for the building of the necessary majority, right? If you think about something like NAFTA, for instance, it was carried by a coalition of centrist elements in both parties. It was unpopular on the extreme wings, extreme. It was unpopular on the both left and the right wing of both parties. And it was carried by a really quite, as it were, a carefully constructed coalition of the centrist elements on both parties. It's not obvious that the GOP is really available to supply the Democrats with the kind of coalition that they would need to push that through in the US right now. But that is the question. Um, and the short answer, of course, is no, there are, all, there are, especially in the United States, going to be at least some elements of capital and some elements of entrenched interests of labor as well, depending on where you are in the US, um, that will feel they're losing out and will lose out quite significantly. The question, of course, is simply how big are they? How much voice do they have? What means do they have of gaining leverage? And can they in some sense be bought off or can at least some crucial element be bought off? Or can they be threatened with the withdrawal essentially of, of the right to operate through severe regulatory action? And, and that I'm sure is the entire game going on, not in the sort of John Kerry side of the Biden administration's climate policy, but the Brian Deeses of this world who are trying to broker national policy deals on things like you know clean air regulation for the utilities and we know i don't need to tell you but like you know that's you know then the the really hard bargaining starts about gas you know how it's going to be rated will it be included how long can it be included for you know those kind of arguments then that's the nitty gritty and each one of those decisions implies a different coalition of poten potential allies and opponents if I was to fault the new the Green New Deal, which I do take as the basic sort of intellectual frame within which all our politics now currently operates, that is the frame which said social crisis, economic crisis, environmental crisis are integrally interrelated and there is no solution that doesn't involve all three in some sense. The, 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 the question that I would I, I did put and would continue to put is, where is the power coalition that they intended to mobilize? It was a, it was a movement organized around what they call frontline communities, um, which has a clear logic within the logic of the Democratic Party and the mobilization of a Democratic majority from the left. What I didn't see, what there wasn't much of, was as it were the articulation of a coalition of entrenched vested interests, which also have to be moved, right? This isn't something that's likely to work by means of a storming of the barricades and some sort of revolutionary shift in power as attractive as that kind of vision might be. What we, if you think back to the history of the actual New Deal in the 1930s, it involved a power play around key uh, business groups, technical groups, expert groups that, that moved the whole, that moved the whole uh, pie, the whole pack. So in the time we have left, I want to sort of move from the crisis of neoliberalism, which we've been mostly focusing on and as it relates to climate to the crisis of globalization that the um, 
the pandemic represented and also how it has changed or not changed our geopolitics. Um, but maybe the first way, the first question to ask is just sort of bluntly, like, why were we unable to respond to this global crisis globally? Why were our responses so nationally determined, independent, often contradictory? I mean, no global travel ban in a period when at a critical period, um, WHO really, you know, sort of in feckless. Um, how did we find ourselves with such inadequate international institutions, but also capacity for real international coordination and cooperation in the face of a threat that everybody in the abstract, you know, would have acknowledged was, was a truly global problem that could not really be solved between national borders? I mean, it's not, <laughs> this is the most, in a sense, the most, you know, irresistible question. Um, and it's tempting to say that this is, as it were, the answer lies in the fact that there were powerful interests that prevented this from being thought as an option. And at some level, that's true. But if you then ask yourself counterfactually, would they not have been better served by adopting aggressive action? Say the global airline industry. Clearly, the global airline industry is not going to favor a rapid shutdown of airline travel in February 2020 um, because it's a total interruption of the status quo in their business. But if you lay out the alternative, which is that we don't do this and 18 months later, you're still miles away from normal, then all of a sudden that option seems almost irresistibly good. Right. And so at that level, it seems to me that we can't simply explain this in terms of interest group failure. And I don't. I explain it essentially in terms of a kind of imaginative failure, a failure to grasp the implications of what the world that we have made. The, the implications of the world that we have made are that if something happens in a huge Chinese city that we actually have to understand as a huge modern rich Chinese city like Wuhan, it impacts everyone in the entire world. What happens there should matter to New York within a week. If they are shutting their airport, we should probably be asking questions about JFK. And we were absolutely not there in February of, of last year. It's not obvious to me if you take the global vaccine program or rather the failure to develop a global vaccine program, whether even this shock has got us there. I mean, one of the one for one of the to me really puzzling, and I'm still struggling to really wrap my head around it. Like one of the standard stories about the climate narrative is okay, we don't get it, we're not reacting adequately, but what we need is a really big shock to shake us out of our complacency. And then finally the penny will drop and people will act. And look what's happened. You know, somewhere the economist estimates between 10 and 18 million people have died as a result of this pandemic. We've had a savage interruption in economic activity. We have continuing interruption of ordinary life. And can one really say that any of the crisis response that we've seen beyond, as it were, just keeping the wheels on the bus and preventing a social crisis is actually in a sustained way directed towards the thing that just did this. I mean, you and I were just talking a lot about, as it were, how adequate the crisis response was in terms of climate, and it isn't. What have we seen on the biotechnology, biohazard, biomedical risk prevention side? Like there is little bits in the various Biden packages, but it's billion here, billion there, maybe 10 billion over a couple of years. It isn't the huge push that simply says, they told us this was gonna happen. They really did. They've been saying this for 50 years. We know perfectly well, this is not the most dangerous crisis of this type that could hit us. Shouldn't we now be making an absolutely gigantic global effort to be prepared for another one? And in fact, even to just get a handle on this one, which we're still not done with. And, and you couldn't really, I don't think, honestly say that that's where we're at, even with regard to the crisis. And it doesn't have any of the dimensions of the climate crisis, you know, long duration, long time horizons, relatively modest discounted economic costs if you use standard economic models. Like, None of that's true for the pandemic. It's absolutely immediate, upfront, gigantic economic costs that are being incurred right now. And we're still not apparently able to muster the economic resource. And I don't, it's not compelling to me to say that that's due to economic interest. Whose interest is served by not having a massive global 
vaccine program at this current moment. You could say the IP of Pfizer, anyone, I think most people in the know say it really isn't down to the patent issues. It's that they simply didn't build the vaccine program to scale. Um, well, it's interesting you mentioned, you're, you're, you mentioned two major points, you know, sort of episodes there. There's the, the question of airline shutdown early in the pandemic, and then there's the question of um, global vaccine rollout um, quite late in the pandemic. And on the first question, on some level, I'm tempted to say, this may even be Trump's biggest failure, even beyond all the other things that he messed up about the pandemic, was not playing a role of true global leadership, because without American, an American president bullying the airline industry, nobody's going to do that. There's no power um, center that is capable of, um, of bringing any of those vested interests, however limited their power is, to heal in, in the absence of American leadership. And yet, when you look at what Joe Biden is doing, you know, my liberal brain is, I'm inclined to think that he is, do, would, would, would be much more, you know, he'd be much more inclined to play a real role um, of leadership globally. Um, I literally don't understand why he hasn't announced a fully US funded global vaccination program. I mean, the, the cost of it, some estimates are under $100 billion. This is a fraction of the money that we've spent to this point in the pandemic. It would incur, it would produce enormous global goodwill. It's a di diplomatic um, opportunity vis-a-vis -vis China in the sense that our vaccines are much better than theirs and we will like, we'll be um, appreciated much more than Chinese vaccines. Um, what- Not only did he not do that. I mean, not only did he not do that, but America didn't export a single shot for six months. Not, not I mean, effectively it's what, three million, I think, sort of swapped with Mexico or Canada. Like, it isn't just that they didn't organize a global program. America pursued an absolutely radical program of America first. Like, so what, not, what, what explains that? What, why, why, what, yeah, what explains that? I mean, in the first instance, I think it's a measure of just how it freaked out and how absolutely out of control the American situation was. And it, and it, was, it was terrifying. Um, and so in a sense, you know, from a global point of view, you'd say genuinely put the oxygen mask on yourself first because you're panicking and then look after your neighbor once you've done that. But, but the fact of the matter is that Operation Warp Speed was not designed to go global, essentially, right? It mobilized global resources to provide Axe vaccine doses for the US, but it was never in the first instance a global program. And there is a... I mean, it's it's a sort of staggering failure of imagination, I think, and not altogether unrepresentative of other elements of the Biden administration's program, which we don't need to get into the critique of Biden's foreign policy, which has far greater levels of continuity with Trump than we'd imagine. But I also think it's unnecessary to pin it on the US, right? It's true in general um, that there has not been. It, it would be worth Germany's while to fully fund the program. And Germany is a much more trade dependent country than the United States. And the trade off that the IMF has estimated for us is literally 180 to one, right? They think it would cost $50 billion to build a credible global program. And they think the payoff is between seven and $9 trillion. <laughs> and it's like, and economists and political scientists are pretty firm in their conviction that you don't have trillion dollar notes lying around on the street, right? Because if they were real, people would pick them up. And yet half the world's population has, has no access to, to, to vaccines so far, right? It's on the one hand a miracle. We didn't know that these things could be done in January 2020. I remember sitting in, you know, dinner parties with serious, very serious, socially distanced dinner parties with very serious Columbia STEM people saying, "We yeah, coronavirus, we'll never do a vaccine." We've got a whole suite of them now, as you argued in a great essay. We actually had them by Easter, more or less, or at least we had the idea of what it was we were going to do, and and we vaccinated half the global population, but but we have simply not addressed the issue of global equality in a way which, which is worthy of the name. I mean, it's, it's truly staggering. So as a last question, before we move to the audience yeah. questions, how has all of this changed your, and this is a big one, sorry to rush at the end, but how has this changed your view of the state of geopolitics generally? I mean, it's, you know, from my perspective, um, at the outset of the pandemic, it really seemed plausible that, you know, China had quote unquote won. You know, they suppressed the disease at least by, um, you know, by most measures, although we can debate how credible their um, their their data about their um, pandemic responses, but um, and they were playing a kind of a diplomatic role globally in helping coordinate some um, response to the disease that came out of China. 
And the countries of the West, most notably the US, were totally in tatters, suffering many, many times more, with many, many, many more deaths than um, we saw um, in China in particular, but really across um, East Asia. And then, you know, we have the vaccines, which have to some meaningful degree reversed that dynamic, um, demonstrated some amount of, I would say, enduring scientific superiority in um, the countries of the West. Um, and yet, it's not like we've returned to square one with the US and China, and indeed, the China's place in the world more generally. So how do you see, you know, the, the sort of ultimate geopolitical legacy of, of the pandemic? I mean, I, I don't think we should underestimate the significance of the Chinese, uh, you know, it turned into a triumph as a result of the own goals that we, we scored in the West. But I mean, the most significant thing is not so much as it, that, that, that we've moved from, as it were, a foot race measured basically in terms of GDP growth um, to one of open antagonism and, and not, not just friendly rivalry. And they try and dress it up in lots of different forms and they kind of back away from the awesome implications of what they're saying. But if you look at the Pentagon, if you look at the American national security establishment, if you look at people, the people who are actually running US-China relations at this moment, it's radically different from where we were 20 years ago. In fact, it's radically different where we were from the first phase of the Trump administration. I mean, in the first phase of the Trump administration, as it were, the leading edge of the Trumpite push against China was, was Robert Lighthizer. You know, there was an entire like sort of Twitter sphere. Um, Quinn Slobodian wrote these fantastic essays about, you know, Lighthizerism as the new doctrine. By 2020, Lighthizer was the part of the Trump administration that still had a working relationship with Beijing because it was about actually doing trade deals. Whereas the, the leading edge, and it's still true today, are national security hawks who are in the business of contesting primacy with China. That's the shift. So as well as China's done, um, and their problems are essentially that they've done so well that they have virtually no natural immunity and they have to do everything with vaccines and, 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 and quarantine. Um, and I would, I would, I mean, I, you're, it's clearly true their vaccines are not quite as good as the very best ones from the West, and they're not in fact as good either as the AstraZeneca um, or, or the Russian vaccine, which turns out to be one of the sleepers in this race, extremely effective by most measures, very simple. But the Chinese got there first, and they've produced them in far greater bulk than we have. They're still by far and away the largest vaccine producer, and they've exported more to the rest of the world than anyone else either, and they're cheap. And if this is a question not of, you know, the Western obsession with individual safety, but of stopping the spread of the pandemic, anything above 50% effectiveness gets you to where you want to go because it slows down your R0. Anyway, but the main shift is, the main shift is absolutely um, the antagonism. And, and that's what 2020 will be marked by. And, and we're living um, in the wake of that still today, and I think will for the foreseeable future, because America declared economic war on China in 2020. I mean, it, it sort of went below the radar and people aren't paying attention. And the Biden administration has just kind of continued doing it as though, you know, they have all the time in the world to make up their minds about what their China strategy is going to be. But from Beijing's point of view, America began to systematically cripple the leading edge of its technological development. And that is simply not something that Beijing can accept. And it will do everything within its very considerable powers to break that lock grip. And it's an antagonism which is very difficult for the Americans to back away from. And um, a very substantial group within the American national security establishment has decided to try and find a way of uncoupling the military balance of global power from the centrifugal forces of global economic growth. It's a really very spectacular moment in that sense. And they're going to do it by hiving off the ultra high tech sector. The problem is that that's actually integral to the future of economic growth. So it's, it's a very, very high stakes uh, situation we're in. So speaking of the future of economic growth, first question from the audience is, um, what does the fact that we quote unquote survived relatively unscathed a 20% cut in GDP teach us about the value of degrowth as a possible policy to address climate change. And for those who don't may not know, degrowth is the proposition more or less that especially the rich nations of the world should um, restrict their um, especially consumption uh, consumption growth um, in order to sort of stabilize the planet's climate equilibrium. Um, yeah, and then and then Jag, who asked the question, goes on, and I mean selective temporary degrowth in rich nations, which is crucial, right? Because when degrowth is preached as a global gospel, it's obscene in my view. 
Um, it just doesn't take account of the fact that half the world's population lives in material circumstances that are, I think, frank, you know, they're, they, they're a breach of basic human rights in material terms and need to be remedied urgently. The energy consumption of half the world's population needs to be double, triple, quadrupled on a renewable basis. Um, I'm not at all unsympathetic to the idea that folks like us in this part of the world um, need to dramatically reduce their long distance flying need to, in various ways, modify their lifestyles now seriously so as to reduce their material footprint. And there's very few, there are no serious climate scenarios in which we achieve the stabilization that we need, in which that doesn't take, doesn't take place in one form or another. So that, I think, is essential. Whether that really amounts to degrowth depends on really how you ca capture growth. And I'm definitely of the persuasion that there are lots of ways in which we could enormously improve our collective well-being, various types of public wealth that would show up in the GDP statistics quite happily as growth, but simply would be dematerialized. And I don't say this glibly because this is one of the standard glib liberal answers is, oh, we'll just dematerialize economic growth and it can go on. Right? That actually requires huge interventions. It requires a quite fundamental rethink of our preferences. Um, and I don't think at that level, I think if the implication here is that this is, uh, you know, that we need to learn lessons from 2020, the answer is yes. But the fundamental lesson that we also learned in the advanced economies and many middle income countries is that the question of the just transition is absolutely acute, right? Because those of us who are privileged enough to have great Wi-Fi connections, to be able to work from comfortable circumstances, to have secure employment, adjusted reasonably well to the shock. And not that is clearly not true even in rich societies for say the bottom half of the income and wealth distribution so whatever we do um it needs to be a structured policy uh uh in which however the highly carboniferous consumption of the top 10 percent is curbed it has to be there's no there's no other alternative and me personally certainly i've learned to live and do things on Zoom I never thought possible. And it's quite difficult for me to imagine going back to my ridiculous, the, um, you know, airborne lifestyle of the pre-crisis period. I guess as a, as a footnote to that answer, I would just plug a piece in your chart book newsletter, which I found incredibly illuminating, which was about the, um, you know, we often talk about carbon footprints of the, of the globally wealthy, and that is an important way of thinking about it. But as you pointed out, it's really about the wealthy distributed across the nations of the world, which means, um, I mean, it has a number of implications for, for climate policy, but it also just at a conceptual level means that um, we're talking not just about the rich people in places like the US or, or Britain, but um, rich people all around the world who are, are behaving. Um, it's the global ruling class, the global upper middle class that has to quite fundamentally rethink the way in which we live, eat, travel, work, everything. Second question, um, will government spending eventually cause economic chaos? Maybe another way of putting this is for a generation or more, we had a very strict sense of how much governments could spend without risking you know, runaway inflation. Um, is it your view that, that, the, uh, that our previous understanding, we just have to like raise that ceiling or is it that there's no ceiling at all anymore and that there's no risk of um, inspiring problem or producing problems through um, more aggressive government interventions in the economy? I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's quite easy to imagine how it could. Um, um, but I think I would make two, I'd make, you know, I think so this is a judgment call at some level and it's a matter of politics again. It's a matter of how we do it. Um, but intelligently deployed government spending, um, given the slack resources that we have in almost all advanced economies, is at no risk of pushing us immediately into a period of turmoil. If we think of the last period of economic chaos generally recognized in the West, it's the 1970s. And we simply do not have the political economy. We do not have the trampoline. We do not have the mechanisms of a wage price spiral, which in that period drove uh, you know, what people in retrospect think of as of chaos. And I think as a sort of, I don't mean this as a debating point, but as a conceptual point, you know, we think about what has caused economic chaos recently. It really wasn't government. Um, you know, it was on the one hand, a shock coming out of the environmental economic system in the form of the pandemic. Uh, and on the other hand, the implosion of the private financial system in 2008, which certainly caused chaos and was not driven by government intervention. Government twice over now has actually served as a stabilizing force. 
That doesn't mean it always will, and one can well imagine uh, government policies that might not. Uh, but we certainly don't need to be concerned about immediately, I think, riding off a cliff. And at the risk of pushing us a couple minutes over, I'm just going to ask you one last question from the audience um, before we bring this to a close. And that is, um, given that the pandemic is far from over, what will the impact of kicking 9 million workers off of unemployment on Labor Day be on the labor market? And I would just add to that, you know, this is a practical question of what the effect it's going to have on the labor market. Do you think that it marks an end to, you know, the beginning of a new of a new austerity moment? Or is it a sort of, um, you know, in, independent um, political event that may or may not uh, forecast our near and medium term future? I genuinely don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand how this was allowed to happen. I don't get it. Um, I don't think that, you know, the Fed would not be pursuing the monetary policy that it is if it was confident that the economy was robust. The latest round of job numbers were not as good. I mean, not the, the latest round of labor market data last week were not as good as people anticipated. Um, this the, the problem of the crisis has above all afflicted the most hard up Americans, the most precarious Americans. These are not the people where you would want to stop, start with cutting government expenditure. And I do fear that this is the beginning of a transition, because the thing about fiscal policy action is you have to keep adding to it. This is why conservatives tend to refer to it as like an addiction, like a heroin addiction. Each fix you deliver has an effect at the moment you deliver it. But then the question is to maintain, as it were, the benefit of that. A, you have to maintain the expenditure and B, ideally, you need to add to it to keep adding to the stimulus because it's the increment, it's the delta, it's the change that actually delivers the boost. The real fear of the current moment is that as these programs expire, expire, we have the reverse effect, which is a fiscal cliff effect in the other direction, which is that they simply stop spending the money and that then delivers a major negative shock to the economy. And in this case, some of the most vulnerable members of our community and our society. So I think it's bad politics and bad economics. Well, Adam, um, before our hosts take over, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a pleasure talking with you and thank you to all the people in the audience who've um, been listening and asking questions. Um, I hope it was as enjoyable for all of you and illuminating for all of you as, as it was for me. So um, thanks again. Um, Adam, David, thank you both so much. Uh, just for shedding light of this ongoing pandemic and the economic consequences because of it. Um, to our audience member, like David said, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to purchase Adam's new book, Shut Down How COVID Shift the World's Economy, you can do so by clicking on the link on the chat. Uh, Adam, any final words before we depart? I would just like to echo what David said to thank everyone for coming and to thank you folks for hosting us and to say that the but the, 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 um, the, the books will be on your way and I will be trying to sign the, the, the bookmarks for you so you'll be getting those. Uh, thank you very much for turning out this evening and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing some of you perhaps in person at a future event uh, if we get through this. Thank you everyone, have a good evening, take care. Mm -hmm.